everyone. Welcome so much to tonight's Fireside Chat, and thank you for joining us. We have a record number of attendees at this event. We have over 500 people attending this event, so it's very exciting. And we are here to talk with Ji Hoon Rin, the former CEO of Kakao, which is one of the largest and most famous social media companies in Korea, and also now uh, a visiting professor here at Stern. So we are super lucky and super glad to have you, Ji Hoon. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, Melissa. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to speak about, you know, talk about cacao and also share my experience um, that I had there, especially about innovation. Good to be here. Excited. Thank you. So just so the audience knows, we're going to talk for a while. I get to ask all the questions here in the beginning, uh, but go ahead. And when you have questions, put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And at 645, our moderator will come in and start sort selecting from some of those questions so that your questions can be answered by Ji Hoon. And uh, with that, we'll, with no further ado, we'll get going. Okay. So Ji Hoon, can you tell us a little bit about the path that landed you as the CEO of Cacao? Because that's pretty, pretty exciting. And you look really young. You, you told me at the beginning of the session that you're in your 40s. So uh, right. you look like you're about 18. So let, let's hear about your path that you took. Yeah, this, you know, look a little bit of a Zoom magic, I think. Uh, but anyways, so yeah, it was a little bit unusual, you know, that I became the CEO of a large tech company. Um, when I was like 35 uh, in 2015, but I'll begin right after, you know, when I graduated from college. So um, I didn't really have like a career path or career plan, uh, you know, to become like a CEO of a large tech company. I didn't really know what to do uh, when I, you know, graduated from college. So for the first five years, I kind of moved around from this company to that company. So in the beginning, I kind of worked at a tech company named Naver, which is a pretty good one. It's like the number one search, you know, a company in South Korea. But after that, you know, I kind of realized that um, even though I came out from an engineering school, I was not like the best. There were so many great people there, like the geniuses. And I was like, you know what, uh, I'm pretty competitive. So I don't, I don't really like losing, right? So I was like, oh, you know what, maybe I'll try something else. And then even now, and even back then, you know, uh, big consulting companies were like a very favorite ones for, for smart people. So I thought that maybe I'll try McKinsey or Besiege or Bain um, if I go into like, get into like those top three uh, consulting companies, that's gonna be good. And then I ended up going to the Boston Consulting Group and I really didn't like it. Um, I kind of, I mean, so, so basically, while I was moving around here and there, it was kind of finding the intersection of what I'm good at and what I like. If you really think about it, that's, that's where it's true, right? But um, I was pretty good doing the consulting job I, and I really kind of hate it. And one of the biggest reasons that I didn't really like it is back then, I heard that now it's a little bit different, but back then, you know, um, we had a, a kind of an attitude that those kind of strategy consulting people are more smarter, you know, than the industry people and that we have to teach them how to, you know, come up with strategies. And as a person who had, you know, um, uh, some experience working at a tech company, I didn't think so. I, I was like, you know what? The industry people are not less smart than you are. They're, maybe they were less trained to come up with those kind of strategies, but I don't think that is, is the matter of smartness. So I only was there like for a year. And then out of nowhere, um, actually a good friend of mine was telling me, hey, Ji Hoon, I think um, you should try out venture capital. And I was like, oh, what's venture capital? Is it like finance? I didn't even know what venture capital is. And that was 2007. So um, I had to Google actually, because back in, in 2007 in South Korea, venture capital was not a big industry. It was not popular at all. But after you know, reading a bunch of you know, Silicon Valley stories, uh, I kind of figured out that, oh, you know what? This is kind of an intersection of tech and also like business. And the more I get to know it, it's, it's people business. And I love, you know, meeting people, smart people talking about the future. So I was like, hey, I should try this out. And I went to SoftBank Ventures, the Japanese, you know, um, SoftBank, the same SoftBank, the investment arm of SoftBank. And I stayed there for five years. Um, and luckily enough, I think venture capital is kind of a luck business. Of course, you have to be smart, you have to be good, but on top of that, um, if somebody says that, you know, um, luck is not a huge factor in venture capital, I'm pretty sure that he or she is lying. 
Um, so, I mean, there was a huge luck part of it and I became pretty successful and I became a little bit famous in the industry. And that was the time in 2012 that I kind of figured out that, you know what, I'll, I'll create, I'll, I'll found my own venture capital fund, right? Because I thought that there's gonna be uh, an opportunity that if I go extra early, extremely early stage, there are some, you know, normally at that time in 2012, if you invest pre-revenue stage, uh, most of the VC, you know, claim that they are early stage. But I saw an opportunity that I could invest in pre-product stage. So basically it's just betting on people. And uh, that was kind of my, you know, competitive advantage because I kind of had the network. And yeah, I, I founded that company, KQ Ventures in 2012. And again, you know, a huge luck part came in and a, a lot of, you know, investees, our portfolio companies, we're doing really great, like, like 10x, like 50x. Um, and then that was the time, you know, in 2015, all of a sudden the board and the chairman of Kakao approached me and they were telling me that as they were having some difficulties, it was right after a big merger with another tech company and their revenue and operating income was going down, which is unusual for a tech company, right? So they were asking me that, um, well, would you become the CEO of Kakao? And I was like, you know what? I have never thought about it. I, I, I'm a venture capitalist. I, I don't have like operational experience. And you know, this company, I founded it. I, I'm having fun here. Um, but you know, after having a lot of conversation, I kind of realized that maybe, you know what, um, I should try this because at the end of the day, um, this, the role of a CEO, um, it's not really doing the operational work, the job, I think. It's really appointing the right leaders and doing the resource allocation, setting the direction. So I was like, you know what? Um, it's not like extremely different from what I did. So yeah, I'll, I'll give a shot. And if I fail, um, I'll go back to venture capital. <laughs> wow. So that was my, uh, that was my you know, um, um, story. And again, you know, it, it was nothing that I planned. So you know, again, and when I was in college, I didn't know what to do. Even after I graduated from college for five years, I think you know, I didn't even know what I would end up. So um, there are many students, I think, uh, who are listening to this. Don't be disappointed that you don't know what you're doing. I didn't know what I was doing, even, you know, for five years, I think. That's an incredibly inspiring story, Jihan. That's amazing. I'm sure all the students in the audience are finding this just really, really interesting. Um, what do you suppose were some of the most important things you learned in that role as CEO? Um, I have to begin uh, by saying that, you know, a CEO job is pretty tough. And sometimes it's not really fun, especially if it's a public, you know, company. At the time that I became the CEO of Kakao in 2015, it was already a pretty large tech company. The market cap was like six billion. Uh, when I decided to quit and step down, it was around like it doubled. It was like twelve billion dollars, and mm -hmm. now it's like twenty billion dollars. But anyways, at that time, it was around like five six billion dollars, and you know. Um, you have huge responsibilities, a lot of scrutiny from the press. And not only that, you know, the decisions that you have to make, if you really think about all the decisions that go up to the CEO are the controversial ones. For example, closing businesses. And if you close a business, basically that affects the life of your employees, your colleagues, right? So it's, it's not a fun job. You have sometimes, not sometimes, um, I have to be honest, as an outsider, I went in and I had to replace some, you know, senior executives because I had to change the direction of the company and it's never fun to do that, right? So those are like a few tough things uh, that you have to do as a CEO. But if I just have to pick one thing um, as, as, you know, a leader, as a senior executive or CEO that is most important, I think, is leading your direct reports so basically I, I'm the CEO. So I had like 10 senior vice presidents, right? And if you think about it, those people, they are all super talented. Uh, they have power within the company already, of course. And they are super ambitious, which is not a bad thing because being ambitious in a company that brings the energy to the company. So the thing is like, some people might think if a CEO makes a decision and sets the direction everybody will follow, that's not the case. That's not the case. You know, there, there even might be a few small number of executives who disagree and, you know, has his or her own agenda, right? So align, you know, letting them do their work 
you know, making sure that, you know, they trust me and I trust them, but still, you know, um, making sure that they are aligned to the direction that we set together. That's, that's kind of art. It's not like, you know, delivering a PowerPoint presentation and saying that, hey, you have to do this. It doesn't happen like that. The worst thing is going to be, you know, I, I, do, I do like a, a, a you know, um, town hall meeting and say something and, you know, that executive goes back to his or her department and says that, hey, you know what, uh, that's not that important. You know, you just do what I, I say you. So those kind of things, um, um, maybe like the most important thing. And um, if I just close up uh, on this part, because I believe it's really important. Uh, and this is like a, a small tip that I want to give for anybody who's uh, in the leadership position is that how I, you know, think the best way is to lead uh, the people over there is by having one-on-ones regularly, like almost every week. Because even though you're having a senior executive meeting, uh, there's a high chance that they're not going to speak out their minds thoroughly. Because even among the senior executives, there might be some power imbalance. So if a, if, if a very powerful senior executive says something, it's a little bit difficult to disagree in front of the others, right? So, um, to and, and every person has different kind of leadership styles. So rather than only, you know, getting the information and understanding by that kind of um, a meeting, I always did one-on-ones with my senior executives. Sometimes I even went below that, you know, level and, and met my other executives below them and had, you know, one-on-ones like bi-weekly. And that was the perfect time to kind of understand that person better and, you know, learn their leadership style and know their personal and, and, and you know, work struggles. And that was the perfect time that could, you could listen. And, and then having, you know, that itself already creates the sense of, of value that those executives is going to say, Hey, our CEO really listens, right? I, I'm feeling valued. So that was like kind of my secret sauce in, in, in leading people. I have to say. Cool. That's super useful to know. Thank you. Um, so kind of related to that, how did you guys at Cacao think about innovation? Were you thinking three years out, five years out? Was it very ad hoc or was it very structured? Right. Uh, that, that's a very important question, Melissa. Um, uh, and and th- basically, that's that's the uh, main topic of today's you know um, session, I guess, right? So uh, before jumping into what Cacao did, I just want to spare a little bit of time, like a few minutes, like two or three minutes, about innovation, because you know I personally think that innovation is super important. Yet it's one of the most misused terminology. And one of the reason it is, is because we, most of the time, whenever we describe innovation, we come up with some objectives like disruptive innovation, uh, breakthrough innovation, or discontinuous innovation. So basically we, we're giving the idea that innovation has to be something very unusual, big, super technological, but I believe that it's not always the case. And maybe you know, the other kind of uh, innovations that brings value to people is going to be even more important, I believe. For example, you know, in the tech world, we always have these kind of debate whether a company is innovative enough or not. You know, if you really recall, other than Google, for example, everybody agrees that Google is innovative, but other than Google, there was a time that uh, some people were saying that Amazon is not innovative. It's just an e-commerce platform. There was a time that people said that Facebook is not innovative. It's just, you know, a social media. Um, And maybe the most controversial company was like Uber, for example, saying that, hey, that's just, you know, calling a cab with your smartphone. Why is that, you know, innovation? Um, And I totally disagree because, you know, actually the core of Uber and Lyft, it's not, you know, just, you know, riding a cab. It's having that on-demandness. Assume that, you know, that Uber or Lyft uh, wouldn't come within a few uh, minutes, would you take it? No, it's a totally different value proposition that they created. And actually because of that, uh, there was a research uh, showing that 60 or 70% of the, you know, ride hailing users previously were not like uh, uh, regular, you know, riders of taxis. They used public transportations but this was like a totally new um, uh, value brought to them. So they were using uh, ride hailing services. So 
if if you so that's the reason they created a whole totally new market. And if you ask me if it's that's an innovation, I, I totally think it's innovation. So the reason the reason I, I came up with all this is because you know a lot of innovations that we did at Cacao, my team, I'm so proud of them because basically they did all the innovation. You know, the CEO uh, doesn't really have a big role in in creating those kind of innovations. Is that uh, our motto, our philosophy was we should, you know, since we are the messenger, just, just a little bit of background to the users, to the viewers who don't really know Kakao that much is that, you know, Korea's population is 50 million and Kakao Talks, which is our messenger, daily active user is over 40 million. So basically every day, wow. the whole population is using it, right? Think about wow. the babies who don't have smartphone, the people <laughs> who don't have smartphones. So basically everybody has it. So if you think about it, the way we viewed innovation was not like rocket science innovation. It was how can we bring something better to our users? So um, I think um, maybe um, I can bring a few examples. Uh, do you want me to talk about you know some examples, or do you want to think about yeah. talk, talk about you know the methodology that I thought about? Um, well, why don't you start with the examples, and then we'll talk about the methodology. Okay. Okay, so um, for example, uh, I'll bring up a few cases, you know, uh, very simple cases, because I believe this this also is innovation. We, we were like a messenger, right? So basically we have friends on the messenger, it's a social graph. And if you really think about it, there are some times, um, not your very closest friends or your, your family, but for example, colleagues or a little bit of weak ties that let's say that it was his or her birthday and you want to, you know, recognize it and, and, and kind of, you know, say something, um, a messenger is the perfect platform to actually send a gift if you think about it. So what we did was, you know, we enabled sending a gift through a messenger. You pick up, you could pick a friend and then you send, for example, a digital coupon of Starbucks and that person could just go to Starbucks and, you know, redeem that uh, cafe latte or something. And we didn't stop there. That's the easy part, actually. Um, a little bit more brilliant uh, business model was actually that you could also send physical goods. For example, you want to send like a coffee set to them, right? And, but if you go to your colleague and ask, hey, you know what, um, I wanna send you a gift, what's your address? That's a little bit creepy. So what we did is that you first buy that thing, buy that coffee pot and just send it. And the, the, then the recipient decides whether he or she is gonna re, you know, accept that gift. And if they do, then that's the time when the recipient types in the address. So I don't even have to know. If I'm sending you something, I just you know, send it and you decide whether you're gonna take it and you type in your own home's address, right? So that was wow. like a tweak. And that was like a kind of a business model innovation, right? And that tweak created a huge market. So the total transaction volume, you know, within like two years, it surpassed $3 billion US wow. dollars. So it was, it was huge. So, Wait, who did Those you have to connect to to make that work? Like what kind of partners are required to make that work? So basically uh, we didn't do the commerce all by ourselves, right? Because we're not like a commerce company. So basically it's like, you know, the third party Amazon. So we had to, we provided the platform and we, you know, invited a lot of, you know, products, a lot of merchandises and, and the users are picking from them. Wow, that is so cool. We don't even have, we don't have that here. That sounds like a really neat thing to have. I know. WhatsApp should do that. Hey, WhatsApp, you should copy us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get, get Jihoon to help you copy it here. Um, <laughs> is there any other examples you want to share with us? Okay. I mean, um, I, I can come up with another one, for example, you know, um, um, Cacao Bank, I think. You know, when I was reviewing the Cacao, so basically Cacao Bank, it's, um, it's nothing like super new. Um, as you can imagine, um, we entered into the banking business um, and the basic premise was that um, we're not going to have a physical branch. So everything is going to be online, right? So at the time when I was reviewing, you know, the business plan, um, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a good, you know, it's a fintech. It's a good opportunity. This was 2015, right after I became the CEO. Uh, but I wasn't really sure because, you know, even at that time, um, the major Korean banks all had apps like Chase. It was really similar as uh, like Chase app. So I was like, yeah, it's good to have this, you know, uh, business as a portfolio, but I'm not really sure that uh, uh, we can really win the competition, but I just approved. Um, but they totally, my team, I'm so proud of them. They totally proved me wrong. Within two years, actually, um, we were able to acquire 10 million customers wow. who, opened, who opened a bank account. 
so what happened is that there was, an, an, in the middle of, of, of that, you know, um, app development, there was a session I still remember, and they were telling me that uh, they're not going to create a website for this bank, this cacao bank. They were telling me that they're only going to focus and create a mobile app. And my original, of course, reaction was, hey, wh why don't you just, you know, open up another channel? I know that, you know, mobile is more important, but, you know, there are some people who are not very used to, you know, mobile apps. And is there any reason to block that website, right? And um, their response, the product team of Cacao Bank was perfect, you know? So that's the reason they all have the credit um, is that they told me the key of this product is simplicity. Look into all other, you know, banking apps, you will see so many menus. Um, consumer doesn't really know what to do. Uh, the rates are here and there, you get confused. So they were telling me that if you really wanna, what do you do with a bank? Basically you save money, you borrow money and you send money, right? Other than that, why do you even have to have a menu? So the user UI, the UX that they created was brilliant. They didn't even have menus. It was like one page and it was just, you know, save money, send money and borrow money. Wow. And basically all the data, you know, was calculated behind the scene. So the rates, for example, was not predefined because we kind of had a lot of data, right? And, and the original credit score that a lot of, you know, um, our finance companies has, um, we combined those. And then after, uh, for example, a, a user just clicks uh, borrow money, then within like 30 seconds, um, you get like, hey, you could borrow like uh, $50,000 and your rate is 4% and you just click it and you get it. So that was the core. And they were telling me if we create a PC version, a web version of that, the user experience is gonna be very weird. With a mouse, I don't see it, they were telling me. And, and I was like, okay, you know what? You, you are the people who think about this 24 seven. Um, I don't know, uh, just do what you believe in, right? Um, uh, just, just let me know if there's anything wrong. And again, that's the reason, uh, this is the perfect example of innovation you know, it's not like rocket science, I think, but still within that competitive landscape, they, they, they became like the largest, you know, digital bank in South Korea, the number one, wow. and they totally proved me wrong. So I think it, it was super beneficial to the customers. So I think this is innovation, right? Yeah, for sure. That's a really cool story. Okay, so you promised us you would tell us something about your methodology for thinking about innovation <laughs> or structuring innovation. Now that you've already shown us that you basically just, you know, don't, in that example, you didn't have to structure anything. You just let people pursue something they believed in, even though you didn't believe in it exactly in the beginning. Right. So, I mean, one thing I have to, you know, a uh, disclaimer, I think, is that there are many ways to do business, right? So um, I'm not saying that I'm the right, I have the right answer, but in my case over the, you know, especially for the years that I led Kakao for three years and over my course of uh, venture capital, uh, you know, career, um, I'm not a huge fan of top-down innovation. Uh, I'm a huge believer of bottom-up. And whenever we, we're having a discussion of innovation, I think we have to first make a distinction between innovation um, within an existing business and innovation for new business, right? Because um, I, I think these two, the methodologies that an executive has to approach is totally different. Because let's say you're running Cacao, for example, like the two pillars of Cacao's revenue was advertising and gaming. And for example, you know, those numbers are like billion dollars, right? You can't go to the ad business and say that, hey, um, you know, the key of innovation, I think it's, you know, a lot of failures. So do whatever you want to do, uh, uh, bring a lot of failures. It, it's nonsense. I'm pretty sure that even Google, you know, um, they have their own KPIs. Uh, they're measuring all the, all, the, all the, you know, metrics. And, you know, um, they're, they're, they're making sure that the business is growing. So those kind of innovations are slightly different from bringing in total new business and new innovation. So um, again, uh, if I focus on, on the new businesses, I really believe that um, you have to let them do their work because there are so many things um, that on paper 
you don't really realize what's going to uh, happen. And there are so many examples um, that I went through. If I, if I have reviewed, you know, that business on paper, there's a high chance that I would decline and disapprove, you know, that project. But because I, I made, you know, a decision that, you know, when it comes to the new development of innovations, um, I really trust our engineer, our product people, uh, just bring it out and, but make sure that you share that prototype with the company, right? Then I think that that's gonna be a natural buy-in system because we're tech people, we're, we're all experts. And if, if a team, a small group of team, like let's say four people are working on a great idea and then they share it, and then it naturally, a lot of people, we had like an internal Slack system and then a lot of, you know, our employers, our colleagues were, you know, writing down, hey, this is fabulous. I think we should really double down. So it's not me or executives, you know, picking which innovation to do. It's letting them, you know, letting them experiment. And then, you know, out of that, naturally, uh, we can pick the winner. So that's, I believe, how to do the, the, the new innovations. And when it comes, you know, to the existing business innovation, it's much more difficult, honestly speaking, because if you have to meet the target, right, we're, we're doing like quarterly um, reports, right, um, um, and with the investors, and you can't really say that, hey, we didn't meet the target because we were playing around. So honestly speaking, um, I, have to, I have to tell, you know, the executives that, you know, you have to, it would be really desirable that we have to, you know, meet the target. Um, and within that boundary, uh, we, we should, of, of course, also improve. So normally, it's really difficult to come up with a disruptive innovation within this existing, you know, a business that is generating a lot of money. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a CEO, it's, I, I don't think that you're sending the right message if you're asking your, your executive and your team, hey, you know what, you, also, you, you have to meet the target, one. And you also have to be disruptive. That doesn't make sense, right. I think, right? Right. Right. So, so just to recast what you're saying, the, uh, the way I would have thought about it. So you're saying in your existing businesses that are successful and you are become reliant on them for cash flow, uh, there's not a lot of room for experimentation there. And it, it's just too risky. But for new business areas, you give them some autonomy. You let them improvise and experiment a bit. And you're not necessarily using financial metrics to measure their success because it would be very difficult for those new projects to to hurt to clear that kind of financial hurdle because it's too unknown. So instead, you're relying on more qualitative uh, information or or the strategic True. relevance of the product. True, Something. totally, totally. Uh, and when it comes to you know the existing business, of course, there could be like small innovations. For example, you know, uh, better product features. That's for sure. They have to do that. Um, right. But, you know, as you said, uh, when it comes to new innovation, it's really hard. You don't even know how that idea is going to turn out. And sometimes you, you're underestimating the, the power of your engineering team or your product team. For example, uh, this is like a perfect example, you know, I think, uh, because um, one day there was like an, an engineer, engineering team coming to me and telling me that, hey, you know what? Uh, we didn't report this to the executive level but we were working on the translation system. And I was shocked because if that came up, you know, um, on paper, I'm pretty sure that a lot of us would think that, hey, you know what, Google is doing this, right? Google is already doing great in machine learning and AI, especially when it comes to, you know, natural language processing and translation, language translation. But actually what they came up was really, really good. And we had the advantage this is what I learned later on after talking with them that we had, you know, basically it was data feeding, right? Deep learning and data feeding. And because, you know, our engineers um, knew the language much better, they knew which type of, you know, data they had to feed in better. And if I, if I didn't know whole this process and if I reviewing on paper on a PowerPoint deck, I would just say that, hey, you know what? Let's focus on what we're good at rather than you can do something that Google is already doing. So this is another perfect example. I think that, you know, they're right. Um, me as a CEO or the senior executives, we don't really know what kind of innovation can happen. Yeah, yeah. Was there a lot of slack at Cacao, like a lot of extra resources that gave you more of more room to sort of play with innovations like this than maybe a company that's in a slim margin, highly competitive business? 
Uh, we did. But again, I think um, I have to be honest, you know, the people who are working in the managing business part, the existing business part, you know, um, business was a little bit more important. The priority is like that. You can't, you know, if you really think about it, and I I have friends at Google too, but Google is the same. If you really think about it, even though they say that it's 20%, you know, time, for example, if you are working in, in, a, in a department or a business that really has to, you know, meet the target, you can't really go to your boss and say, hey, you know what, uh, this Friday, I'm going to work on another project. But you didn't even, you know, finish uh, your job that you have to do. That doesn't make sense. So honestly speaking, when it came to the existing businesses, you know, that really have to generate, you know, um, 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 cash flow, uh, they didn't really have a lot of slack for innovation. Uh, but when it comes to the new business development part, like they were spending 80%, 100% of the time, you know, experimenting it. Then, the, then you, you're going to face a lot of issues within the organization. For example, there are going to be some top talent in your business, you know, group saying that, hey, you know what, I also want to do those kind of cool things, right? Why are they doing that? And I can't do that. Yeah. So, then, then the company, you know, what we did uh, was that we gave them a transfer option, right? Because every, everything has a pros and cons. For example, if you're working in a business group, for example, uh, and, and, and if that business is doing really well, um, the bonus pool is even higher, right? Versus if you go to the innovation pool, maybe you're getting the average bonus pool. So every decision so so it's really uh, of the risk appetite and you know the way how you want to do it so we we opened the gate and said that hey for those who are working here and if you really want to go to that side yeah you could because basically you know the people the engineers the product people who are working at Kakao were very talented and we kind of enabled that right so so you did or did not have 20 percent time officially no we didn't want to make official and yeah. um yeah, I'll just stop but, there. I'm not going to talk about, you know, Silicon Valley companies, but yeah, yeah. But some individuals got some time to work on projects. A lot, you know, again, you know, those who didn't have that, you know, business mandate, for example, uh, of course, yeah, they were playing around, especially, you know, the tech group, the AI group, um, because basically, unless you're really experimenting it, you don't know how well uh, the results going to be. So they ha really had to, you know, play around. But again, um, I made, you know, we made sure that, you could spend uh, your time doing whatever you want, but you have to share it. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to have time, you know, to talk about uh, what I really believe is important in creating uh, a culture of innovation. I think uh, shall I shall I do yeah, that? Yeah, talk about it. We'd love to hear okay, that. Okay, right, right, right. So basically, um, it's letting them do their work, right? But it doesn't mean that it's a totally hundred percent hands off, you know, uh, management, right? Um, one thing that I, I, I wanted to make sure is that all of their work has to be shared within, you know, the company internal system, okay. something like it was similar to Slack. So basically, it's not that, hey, you have to share this. It's like the, the sharing was a default. So if you don't, if, if, if there is a reason that you believe that you cannot share this, tell me. Other than that, everything has to be shared. So those kind of things, you know, uh, brought down the silo uh, within the company, if you really think of it, because actually the biggest, you know, challenge uh, of innovation, I believe, is the silo within a company. Yeah. So yeah. Those, those kind of, you know, um, 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 mandatory sharing of their work um, automatically uh, that brings in, um, you know, cooperation, collaboration, then all of a sudden somebody from another department you know, write something, post um, comments. Hey, you know what? Actually, our team was also working with that. So that's public. So there cannot be, you know, the politics within a, a company kind of reduces because you can't really control all the engineers, right? And their yeah. engineers writing down like comments over there that, hey, I think we should, you know, work together. And then if it was only, you know, senior executives having that information, um, some office politics could happen, but if it's like an open space, you know, sharing your work and people commenting on that, um, it's a little, it, it's much difficult, you know, you know, to block and hinder that kind of innovation. So I think that's super important. And the second, I think it's two things. One was that sharing. And the second part is that um, 
You Wait, have can to I get a clarification? I want to get a clarification on that last part. Did you have some sort of tool for facilitating sharing, like some sort of idea collection and dissemination system? Actually, that was our internal system, right? So okay. I was telling you that it's very similar to Slack. So basically, okay. it's, it's kind of a, a workspace that you could share and, you know, you can call in people. So rather than using email, actually, we basically um, shared all our work you know, on that internal Slack kind, okay. of Slack kind of system. And and the second part uh, that is a little bit, you know, uh, relates to the culture is that um, I, we were always saying, and this is uh, the thing that I really believe is that um, if you're not having a disagreement, whatever meeting you're having, if you don't have a disagreement within that meeting, something is wrong. Wow, that's really interesting to know, wow. So you're encouraging so, this will, this ability to disagree with each other, which is I consider personally extremely important for innovation. But so many companies are intolerant to that. I mean, the thing is, like, um, this is something uh, related to corporate value, right? And and then a lot of people say that we value, um, you know, uh, transparency. That you have to speak up. Uh, we have to listen. But at the end of the day, if you're in a meeting with a, with your boss. And then, you know, you're afraid, right? You're afraid that if you say something, uh, you might sound stupid or even you might, you know, uh, be afraid that the boss might, might retaliate, for example, right? So again, making the default as a disagreement, um, it, it kind of changes, you know, it switches uh, the perspective that, hey, you know what? Uh, this Jihoon CEO, uh, he was having the all hands meeting several times. And he always said that the biggest corporate culture, the most important thing of our corporate culture is disagreement. If we don't disagree, uh, there's nothing, you know, advancing. So, so I, I, I think that was giving them a platform for yeah. the employees, say a little bit easier to say, hey, you know what, uh, did we discuss enough? Maybe, you know, there was not a single disagreement when this, you know, this discussion. So, that's kind of forcing uh, disagreement and giving them a platform. It, actually, it's the same. The default is sharing. If you don't want to share, you have to give me a very solid reason why you can't share your work. And did they disagree with you too? Definitely. You know, um, I mean, you, you can already see from what I was saying about a lot of projects, right? There were not that many huge decisions that I have to make, especially during the course of my CEO tenure. In the beginning, I have to admit, um, I had to change some leadership. Um, I had to change some direction. I had to close like 10 businesses. Um, I have to be honest, but you know, um, the reason that we did this is because we had to focus on the more promising businesses, right? So all those people were getting relocated and then, you know, after that, if after I appointed the, the leaders that I truly trust uh, and they're super competent, right? Um, the thing that I do is just aligning them uh, with and, and checking up. Uh, it's not like me getting into the decision process and saying that, hey, um, this is not right or this is not wrong. Um, so there were not that many, you know, incidents that I have to overturn them or them overturn me. Because basically the default, the, the basic option was, you know, do what you believe. You're, you're better in this area. You, you're the expert in ad business. You're the expert in gaming business. You're the expert in, you know, content business. Um, why should I be the decision maker? Okay, cool. And how typical or atypical in Korea was this sort of disagreement approach? Was that hard to implement in your culture at the company there? Or was, it, uh, was that something people had come to already expect? It, it's, it's difficult. I think uh, this will resonate to a lot of um, Asian students or, you know, people from Asia, especially, you know, um, South Korea, Japan, China, or many, many other countries, for example, because um, you kind of show respect to the elder and you also show respect to the seniority, the people who worked longer than you. Yeah. So um, it's, a, and it, it's a little bit uh, impolite to, you know, disagree in front of someone, right? Um, so that was the reason that, um, you know, at Kakao we were having, before I joined Kakao, we were having so many um, so-called, you know, values that, um, you know, um, our team wanted, you know, for example, you know, the, 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 the 
the, the values that we would treasure as employees. But you know, after reviewing that, they're all nice sounding words, right? Um, and it doesn't re really need, lead to an action. So after reviewing that a lot uh, and talking and discussing with the HR people, I was like, you know what, if I just pick one thing over here, I think it has to be disagreement. We really have to encourage disagreement and make disagreement as a default. So I, I, I had like a separate, you know, um, uh, all hands meeting and talk about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason to have a meeting if nobody says anything, right? And if everybody agrees, then it was you're probably having a meeting about something everybody already knew, right? It's right, exactly. So it's, it's a waste of time. Yeah. Is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known then? Uh, many things. I mean, you know, if you think about it, a lot of the things that I, I was just saying right now, it's not that I knew it from the beginning, right? Yeah. <laughs> from the examples that I'm telling you, you know, a lot of my product team proved me wrong. And, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm so kind of humbled that, oh, thank God that I didn't make this decision on paper. Thank God if I, if, if it was me, you know, I'm pretty sure that I made the wrong decision. So it's not that I knew this. It's not that I, I could learn this from textbook. So all of these examples, um, you know, came from my real experience as leading a CEO. But still, if you're asking me, like, if there were things that I could have done differently or, or you know, that I, I, I know now, and if I go back, could, you know, um, implement it right away, I think it's, um, they are, you know, especially if you're a CEO, if you're a decision maker, uh, and if you have to make tough decisions, um, yeah, it, it's better to make it earlier because actually um, a lot of people within your organization actually not all, but many of them, especially the talent people are also expecting that because let's say if, if there was like a non-performing business, everybody in that business, um, you know, all, all the team over there already know something's not wrong, right? Either the market is wrong, either the leadership is wrong, um, whatever it is, right? So actually there are not that many people who want to lose and who want to go to company to, to work and say that, hey, we, we lost again, you know, our competitors doing much better. Um, I don't want to work here. Uh, no, it's not. Most of the people, most of the employees, you know, want to spend fulfilling time yeah. uh, while working. They want to advance their career. They want to grow. They want to learn something, right? So actually, the, the talented people were waiting for that decision, whatever it is, closing the business, then there's an opportunity for them to transfer to a more promising business or, or, or changing the leadership, replacing, replacing that person to a more competent person. Then, so, so, you know, um, you might, you might feel sorry and it's really difficult to make that kind of decisions. You know, I, I couldn't sleep very well, honestly speaking, because when I closed that business, I said, uh, this decision is affecting so many people. It's people's life. So that's, that's the not fun part of being a CEO. Um, it's not an easy call, but still, um, if you're pretty sure that you have to make that call uh, rather than, you know, pretending that you're giving them another chance because you're not really already, you know, that it's not going to work, but you're just trying to give them, you know, a false hope. And then eventually like three months, six months later, you just do the same, you know, um, decision then that's killing them. So, um, I would rather, you know, make that decision earlier, uh, than later. Gotcha. So I'm being prompted to remind the audience that don't forget, you can post your questions in the Q&A section down below. And while you do that, I'm going to take this opportunity to just ask one last question to Jihoon. Uh, Jihoon, mm -hmm. what technology trends or innovations have got you excited right now? Is there anything you're following that you find particularly interesting? Um, it's really hard to pick like one, um, I guess. But I think again, because I think innovation, uh, we have a huge misconception of innovation. I hear a lot uh, of experts saying that we're not having that, you know, innovation right now. All the things that we see are pretty tedious. Um, and my counter argument to that is that I believe um, there are some horizontal innovations and there are some vertical innovations. So what I mean by horizontal innovations are like, you know, in the late 80s, we had PC in the, in the late 90s, we had internet in the late 2000s, we had, you know, smartphones in the late 2010s, we had AI. So those are like the horizontal big innovative technological changes. And that sounds great. 
that is a time that kind of some kind of breakthrough happens. It's true. But you know, in the meantime, between those times, a lot of vertical innovation happens. And actually these kind of vertical um, innovations really um, affects people's life. For example, FinTech, you know, I, I'm living in, it's been two years uh, coming to the United States and I can't really believe that I still have to write checks sometimes, right? I'm like, I'm receiving checks, writing checks. I'm really, can I just, you know, wire it? And they're like, no, you have to send a check. I'm like, oh, come on. So, so, so those kind of things, um, not only like writing a check, uh, there are so many things that could happen that really affects and makes your you know, life easier. And uh, maybe if you, if you ask me uh, like what kind of interesting innovative company that interests me, um, quite controversially, uh, I would like to pick Facebook because I think Facebook is another company that is totally misunderstood. Um, people say that it's just a social media, you know, and I don't really use it anymore. It's like evil, right? Um, I'm not gonna judge, uh, I'm not gonna comment on that. But if you really think about it, uh, if you look into the data that uh, they're you know, uh, publishing on, on the quarterly basis, the daily active users are still 200 million. Uh, in, in North America, actually it's growing. And on, on top of that, the way I view you know, Facebook is with that daily active users, if you think about it, they're a recommendation engine. Yeah. They, they don't really have to only you know, recommend um, news media. They can do whatever you do, if you think about it. It could be you know, a bunch of commerce services, a bunch of gaming. It could be your local mom and pop shop. And if you think about it, if they're actually doing it and you can see it, they're merging Instagram Messenger and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, they're merging it right into one. And if you think about it, if you have that combined data, and if you think that you can connect those to small and medium businesses, and so whenever you wanna to talk to a small and medium business, um, you're gonna use that kind of Facebook, uh, whatever message it is, uh, that could bring a lot of change in your everyday life. Yeah. Uh, but still a lot of us just, you know, when, whenever Facebook comes up, we're talking about, you know, content moderation, social media, you know, um, news media, something like that. But I don't think that's the core of Facebook. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for that. I think we're now, we, it's now time to turn it over to Liz to share some of the questions from the audience. Hey, Liz. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Chen. Thank you. Um, Jihoon, I'll start uh, with uh, a comment from Mr. George Lee. He says, thank you for being genuine and acknowledging the role of luck in your success. So thank you very much for that. Um, I have a question from Yash. He asks, what tips do you have for students who see themselves in a CEO position in the near future? I mean, if you're a student um, and, or I don't know whether, you know, uh, he or she is in undergraduate or MBA, uh, but still assuming that that person is still in the early stage of the career, right? Um, learning things is one thing, right? I'm not saying that, you know, being smart is not important. I think that's like a prerequisite. That's, that's, that's not enough. Uh, the other part is actually understanding the other people. Again, authority doesn't come naturally even though you're a CEO, you can't just say, you know, set a direction and, hey, you have to follow or I'm going to fire you. It doesn't happen like that. You totally know you have to learn how to lead other people's. And the beginning of that is putting yourself in others' shoe, right? And that's the reason I was saying that having a lot of one-on-ones and learn how to listen, right? Not talking and not try to persuade it. Learn how to listen. And that's going to be, you know, a huge leadership tool that you're going to use uh, when you really become a CEO in your future. Thank you. Thank you. Also, were any of the learnings at BCG useful in decision making as a CEO? Um, I mean, I know I kind of downplayed consulting, right? Um, I was just, um, um, again, you know, consulting, i uh, there are a bunch of smart people over there, right? And the, the way they're structuring the problem and then the way that they're coming up with a recommendation, um, it's good. You know, it, it's great to learn those kind of tools, right? It, it's something that you can learn at business school too. So those are very important. 
But again, the reason that I was kind of a little bit downplaying uh, consulting and the reason that I didn't like it a little bit, as I said, is because that's like only a part of a solution. It doesn't mean that you, if you just send a presentation deck to a company with a bunch of recommendations that automatically that will be implemented. No way. Actually, you know, that deck, that's like 20% of the job, 80% or 90% of the job is really making things happen and, you know, making your employees, your colleagues really believe in that. So, so I, I mean, I learned a lot. I mean, there are a bunch of smart people over there, but um, yeah, uh, that's not all the game. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna combine questions because we have a lot of questions and about 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, what was the time you made the wrong, a wrong decision as a CEO? And what factors prompted your decision to leave Cacao? What would you have done differently in those situations in retrospect? Um, I'm pretty sure that I made a lot of, you know, uh, wrong decisions, um, small and big, but not mission critical, right? If I made some mission critical um, um, wrong decisions, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure that I would have been fired, right? Uh, because I'm a public, you know, company CEO, but um, small, you know, wrong decisions, I think uh, a lot of them, including some of the things that I said before that um, I had to make, you know, the decision much more earlier. Um, I didn't make it um, or I didn't give enough resources to a promising business. Uh, there are many things, right? Um, and again, you know, um, the, the team totally proved me wrong. Those are all examples that I was wrong. Um, right, so that's common. But one thing, you know, um, if, if I talk a little bit about authenticity, I think, because that's another topic that um, a lot is discussed recently. Um, a CEO being authentic, I think is, it's important. So whenever I made those kind of decisions and, and uh, wrong decisions, you know, uh, I tried to become as honest as possible and say that, you know, I got this wrong. But for example, let's say there's, assume there's a CEO and like he or she made 10 decisions and nine out of 10 was wrong, then it doesn't make sense, right? Again, you know, you have to get the right decisions for the important part. So again, you know, luckily enough, you know, I, I chose the right people, the senior executives, they, they, they delivered, you know, a good performance. Again, Kakao, when I was joining the company, uh, it was in crisis. And within a year, actually, we turned around. The revenue operating income all, all, all went up. The stock price went up. So um, I had the luxury um, to, you know, show that kind of, you know, uh, more authentic, you know, um, authenticity, I think. Um, so uh, this, again, goes, uh, all the credit goes to my senior executives who really delivered that business. And uh, this naturally goes to the, the combined question of why I left. Um, you know, again, uh, in the beginning of this, sh if this session, I told you that, you know, uh, being a CEO of a big, large tech company, a public company, it's not all fun, right? You have to make a lot of sacrifices. Uh, you don't really have like personal life, I think. Um, so luckily enough, again, you know, at the time that I decided that I would step down, you know, the revenue doubled, operating income doubled, the stock price doubled. So I thought it was like a perfect time for me and I think you know we made a big change in the direction so from that point it's more about you know doubling down on that direction and executing uh, the reason I was picked uh, as a CEO as I mentioned before is because you know uh, it was a difficult time they needed an outsider who could kind of you know change the direction and luckily enough my team did a great job um, then I thought it was a time for me that I finished my task I could just stay there and, you know, keep, you know, let's say, um, lead the people that I brought in and, you know, just see the result. But uh, that was less, how can I say, challenging for me, less fun for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, um, there are a lot of not fun part of, you know, being a, a CEO of a public, you know, company. Like, for example, sometimes the Congress calls you, you have to go there. It, it's the same, you know, that happens here in, in the States, right? You see... Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and all the famous people, you know, in Congress, uh, that also happened to me in South Korea. So um, those are not, you know, very exciting moments. So um, I thought I did my job um, and I decided that I'll do something else. 
Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine some other questions. With AI and other tech developments, what sectors do you think have the most promise in emerging markets in the next few years? And what do you think of the future of New York City post-COVID or uh, certain unique opportunities there, uh, there will be post-COVID? Okay. Um, again, a little bit related to the previous conversations that we had, you know, AI, it's, it's big. It's, it's a horizontal, you know, uh, innovation. It's a horizontal technology. So for sure, we're going to see a lot of innovations coming out uh, of that. But rather than picking like one big words, right, um, a huge number of innovations that we're seeing now uh, where we're living actually came from small you know, things, if you really think about it, what, what are the wow innovations that blows your mind that you have never thought about, right? If you really think about all the technology that you're using, it's not like rocket science that, you know, bunch of like, like bunch of PhDs have to come up with. It's, it's really, you know, um, using the technology and, you know, making our life much better. So I'm, I'm really excited, you know, on all those things, especially the most painful experiences that a customer has to go through. Those, of course, are, are the, you know, the uh, bright spots for the promising business that will come. Uh, that's for sure. And if you're asking for New York City, um, I'm not an expert in New York City, of course. It's only been two years that I came here, but I love the city. Uh, I'm going to stay here. I love it. And I feel the energy. And post-COVID, uh, there are people who are saying that now, you know, the mega cities are going to fall. I totally disagree. And this is something to do with uh, what I was saying about innovation. Uh, the key value of innovation, the, the secret sauce of, of, of innovation is disagreement, is, is conflict, it's collision. Well, that's so, good because we're really good at that in New York. We're experts yeah, at conflict and disagreement. Right. Right, everybody's angry. <laughs> everybody's yelling at each other. <laughs> so, I mean, that kind of thing doesn't really happen um, um, with Zoom, right? So, so uh, uh, long term, I'm super positive in the power of you know New York City and other mega cities too. Thank you, thank you. Um, two other questions: Is it Korean culture or regulation that leads you to transfer people when you close underperforming businesses? Is it very difficult to retrain the senior older executives? And also, um, how should leaders manage ever increasing gig workers at professional settings? Wow, uh, that's a lot of questions combined. Actually, yes. I think yeah. I have to you know unpack a few because those some of those I think are separate. So beginning with, you know, uh, relocating people, uh, then firing people, uh, basically uh, during my tenure, we didn't have a uh, layoff, right? And I have to be honest, right? Uh, Korean regulation is a little bit more stricter. So if you lay off, you know, uh, a bunch of people, uh, they, they, you, you, you get scrutinized. That's one thing for sure. But the more important thing is actually the tech world, um, you know, it's growing. There are so many things that we have to do. And why would you, you know, those people were at the wrong business unit. Why would you fire them? And still there's a lot of promising business units who always say that they need talent, right? So the key was, you know, uh, making a smooth transition uh, from the people who got closed and, you know, HR did a great job. Actually, you know, they got the preferences, the priorities, like which business they want to work. And we also got, you know, demand from the businesses and, you know, making that matching and, and, and transferring those people. And I think that that's, uh, that's good for the morale, even though, you know, I guess, you know, if, if you can, if you're capable of, of doing that, that's going to be better for your morale of your employees rather than, you know, laying off like 20 or 30% of, of, of your employees. Of course, I admit that there might be some incidents that, you know, um, firing a bunch of people is indispensable, uh, but I was lucky that I was not in that situation. And gig worker, I think is slightly different um, I, because, you know, Kakao was a digital uh, tech company. Uh, we didn't really have gig workers. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to speak for them, um, right? 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have a question from Lena. She says, thank you for sharing your experiences with us so candidly. She's especially inspired by your career choices. She's curious, why have you decided to come to Stern? Of course, it's absolutely amazing to have you here. Interested in joining VC? Any advice for MBA students, please? Okay, um, why did I join uh, Stern? Be because it's a fabulous school, right? <laughs> so, so okay, I'll be, I'll be honest, okay? Um, you know, uh, when I came to New York City, um, you know, it's not like I came to New York City because I got an offer from Stern. No, no, I just came to New York City. I had some friends here. I was having fun. That was like, you know, the second half of 2018. And, you know, uh, some of my friends introduced me to, um, you know, a professor from Stern. And after, you know, um, it was Alex uh, Tushlin from the tech department. And, you know, we were having a long conversation because he's from tech, right? And all of a sudden he was telling me that, hey, um, why don't you teach here? And I was like, really? You know what? I have never educated in the United States. I don't even have an MBA. Um, and, and he was telling me, hey, you should if you want, uh, definitely. And it was really impressive. I think one of the strengths that Stern really has is that that was like November 2018. And, you know, they made a decision. And then I was teaching uh, from February 2019, right? All of a sudden, uh, they were like, hey, uh, open up a course, uh, pick a course, title it, whatever you want to do, and teach whatever you want. And I have huge respect for them because they were not testing me. They were like, oh, I think, you know, you can come up with something valid. And, you know, you know they gave me the full authority to do whatever I, I believed in, right? So that's how I came up with the course titled Managing a High-Tech Company. And then um, I guess, you know, it turned out very well. Uh, a lot of students liked it. And then, yeah, um, I, I loved the interaction that I was having with my students, right? I never thought that I would become like a professor. Um, and then, yeah, that, that became, you know, like one big factor that decided me to stay in New York City. And then after having fun here, you know, um, Thankfully, again, that's the reason Stern is great. Uh, they gave me a full-time offer, right? So now I'm a full-time professor here. Um, so, and the second part of the question, I think, was um, somebody wants to go to venture capital, right? Um, I think um, you have to bring a little bit more uh, than just being smart. Because if you really think about it, um, there are tons of people who want to become a venture capitalist. Now it's like the most, one of the most wanted job, correct? Um, and then uh, most of them are smart. And most of them are from top schools. So there has to be like one thing that totally makes a dif difference, uh, differentiates you. For example, it could be like, you could become like the most network person um, among your peers. So for example, from a venture capital perspective, if I'm a partner at a venture capital and let's say you are that student um, and hey, uh, when I, whenever I talk to, you know, Elizabeth, um, you know, she knows all the potential, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, um, who lives in New York City. So that's gonna be a huge plus. Or let's say that um, um, you have a track record of investing uh, in startups, even though it's like a very small amount, like from AngelList, for example, like you invested $1,000 here and $1,000 there, and you kind of you know, kept track of it and showed that you're really into this you know, industry. Um, rather than okay. just saying that you're interesting. So, so those kind of things is gonna be totally uh, um, different, I think. So bringing one more thing um, is important. Okay, you know what? This was so fun and we could probably keep going for another hour, but we are actually out of time. So thank you so much, ji for a really <laughs> awesome uh, chat. We learned a ton from you. I wanna thank all of you for coming. And I also wanna remind you to, to follow us at, at NYU Stern FC. You can look at Liz's, uh, the name under Liz's picture here. It says at NYU Stern FC to hear about our future events. And thanks again for coming.